controls the Federal Reserve banking system? There are four aspects that have to be examined for you to clearly understand the Federal Reserve banking system. How it came about, who owns it, who controls it, and the end game. How it came about. Bank runs and the panic of 1907 drove Republican Senator Nelson Aldrich, the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, to devise a plan to restructure banking in America. His research and study concluded that a central bank was necessary to manage the nation's economy. In November 1910, six men, Nelson Aldrich, A. Piat Andrew, Henry Davidson, Arthur Shelton, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Warburg met at the Jekyll Island Club off the coast of Georgia to write a plan to reform the nation's banking system. At the time, Jekyll Island was privately owned by a small group of millionaires from New York including William Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan. Senator Aldrich knew these advisors had known ties to Wall Street and the banking industry and felt that if members of Congress were aware of who was helping him develop this new banking reform, its passing into law would never see the light of day. So, Aldrich went to great lengths to keep the meeting secret. He invited these five men to Georgia on a duck hunting trip and provided clear instructions for each to arrive one at a time at the train terminal in New Jersey where they would board his private train car. Once aboard, the men used only their first names to prevent any of the staff from learning their identities. While traveling, they were told not to eat together, not to speak to each other, and to act like they were complete strangers. Upon their arrival in Georgia, they were shuttled by boat to a very private and secluded Jekyll Island, where the use of any communications with the outside world was forbidden. Smartphones weren't around back then, so we're primarily talking about sending messages by telegraph. By the end of their time on Jekyll Island, Aldrich and his colleagues developed a plan for a Reserve Association of America, a single central bank with 15 branches across the country. So who exactly were these six men that decided for an entire nation that we needed a central banking system? First, Nelson Aldrich. He was a prominent American politician and a leader of the Republican Party in the United States Senate, where he served from 1881 to 1911. Because of his impact on national politics and central position on the pivotal Senate Finance Committee, he was referred to by the press and the public alike as the general manager of the nation. In 1909, Aldrich introduced a constitutional amendment to establish an income tax. His daughter Abigail married into the Rockefeller family and their second son Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller was a four-term governor of New York who campaigned for the Republican presidential nomination in 1960, 64, and 68. He was eventually named vice president of the United States under President Gerald Ford by Congress in 1974. A. Piat Andrew, who was the assistant secretary of the treasury. Henry Davidson, the senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. Charles Norton, the president of the First National Bank of New York. Benjamin Strong, the head of the J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. Frank A. Vanderlip, the president of the National City Bank of New York and former assistant secretary of the treasury for President William McKinley. The National City Bank just happened to be the largest of all the banks in America, representing the financial interests of William Rockefeller and the international investment firm of Kuhn, Loeb & Company. Paul Warburg, who was almost certainly the most important at the meeting because of his familiarity with banking as it was practiced in Europe. Paul was one of the wealthiest men in the world. He was a partner in the Kuhn, Loeb & Company and was a representative of the Rothschilds banking dynasty in France and England. 
he maintained very close working relationships with his brother, Max Warburg, who was the head of the Warburg Banking Consortium in Germany and in the Netherlands. These are the men that sat around the table and created the Federal Reserve System. You see, in 1910, both houses of Congress and the American people were extremely anti-central bank. The nation had been functioning without one for the past 47 years, and everyone seemed to have a much better understanding for the economic consequences it imposed. Their challenge was to create a central bank that nobody would know was a central bank. The first of their deceptions was in the name they would call this new institution. They purposefully used the word federal so that it would appear to be an official government entity. The word reserve signifies it would be responsible for keeping extra reserves which makes people feel it's safe. And finally the word system inferring that it was part of a larger checks and balances system and thus a safe entity for managing the economy of the nation. But in reality there is nothing federal reserve or systematic about it. The first draft of the Federal Reserve Act presented to Congress was called the Aldrich Bill. However, since all of Congress knew Aldrich as a lackey for the banking industry and big business interest, the people protested the bill and Congress ended up voting it down. So they carried out the next deception. They removed Aldrich's name from the bill, rearranged the text, and found a couple of Democrats, Carter Glass and Robert Owen, to sponsor it as a new bill. Since the Democratic Party was known to represent the common man, little resistance was invoked. The Aldrich bill became the Glass-Owen bill and worked its way successfully through both houses of Congress. The final deception came in the form of Senator Aldrich and Vanderlip giving speeches and interviews to newspaper reporters berating and bad-talking this new bill. They would say it was a detriment to the banks and the nation's economy. And this reverse psychology worked like a charm. People felt that if they didn't like it and it was bad for the banks, then it must be a good thing. And on December 23, 1913, President Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act. Who owns it? This is a tricky question to be able to answer directly, so instead I will present information I found compelling and I'll let you decide for yourself. As we continue, remember the definition of ownership. Ownership is the act, state, or right of possessing something. We have already established who created the Fed, Davidson and Strong representing J.P. Morgan interests, Norton and Vanderlip representing New York banking interests, and Warburg representing Kuhn Loeb & Company, which was an American multinational investment bank, and the Rothschilds banking dynasty in France and England. Today, the domestic bank giants of Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo own ExxonMobil, Dutch Shell, BP, and Chevron Texaco, along with the foreign banks of Deutsche Bank, BNP, Barclays, and other European old money. According to company 10K filings to the SEC, J.P. Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo are among the top 10 stockholders of virtually every Fortune 500 corporation. The New York Fed branch arguably runs the other 11 Federal Reserve's bank for a variety of reasons, which are too complicated to go into in this presentation. There are multiple sources that claim eight families have 80% ownership of the New York Federal Reserve Bank four of which reside in the U.S., Goldman Sachs, Rockefellers, Lehman's, and Kuhn Loeb's of New York. The remaining foreign families are the Rothschilds of Paris and London, the Warburgs of Hamburg, the Lazards of Paris, and the Israel Moses Saifs of Rome. These elite families control the banking and investment wealth of the Western world. 
Elites at this level have no national identity when it comes to wealth. Wealth at this level provides them with powers beyond nationality and borders, beyond government legislation, and beyond any laws of man. We cannot let ourselves forget that the Federal Reserve banking system is part of the world central banking system and not part of the federal government. None of them are. No nation has any direct control over any central bank. The Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland is the most powerful bank in the world. A global central bank for the eight families who control the private central banks of almost all Western and developing nations. The Bank of International Settlements is owned by the Federal Reserve Bank of England, Bank of Italy, Bank of Canada, Swiss National Bank, Netherlands Deutsche Bank, Bundesbank, and Bank of France. The U.S. government has a historical distrust of the Bank of International Settlements, lobbying unsuccessfully for its demise at the 1944 post-World War II Bretton Woods Conference. Instead, the eight families' power was exacerbated with the Bretton Woods creation of the IMF and the World Bank. The U.S. Federal Reserve only took shares in the Bank of International Settlements in September of 1994. The Bank of International Settlements holds at least 10% of monetary reserves for at least 80 of the world central banks, the IMF, and other multilateral institutions. It serves as a financial agent for international agreements, collects information on global economy, and serves as a lender of last resort to prevent global financial collapse. Other institutions which the eight families control include the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Conference, and the World Trade Organization. The Fed itself may state that the Federal Reserve System is not owned by anyone. To be a member of the Federal Reserve System, the member banks must, by law, invest 3% of their capital as stock in the reserve banks, and they cannot sell or trade their stock or even use that stock as collateral to borrow money. They do receive dividends of 6% per year from the reserve banks and get to elect each reserve bank's board of directors. But the banks must return all profits after paying expenses to the U.S. Treasury. Based on this information, who do you think has the act, state, or right of possessing the Fed? If the government owns the Fed, it should be able to enter and conduct independent inventories at its discretion, and yet Congress has been categorically denied this ability since 1913. There has never been an inventory or complete inspection of the Federal Reserve property or assets in its entire history. Does the government have the right to own the Fed? No. The Federal Reserve Act specifically stipulates the separation of governmental influence from the day-to-day -day operations of the Fed. So if the government doesn't own the Fed and the shareholders don't own it because they have no rights to sell any of their shares, then that leaves who? So let's now discuss who controls it. Control is defined as the power to influence or direct people's behavior or course of events. The Federal Reserve Banks are not part of the federal government, but they exist because of an act of Congress. Its leader is not an elected official, and it is not accountable to either voters or shareholders. There are legislative guidelines that the Fed is expected to operate within, but since 1913, the Federal Reserve Act has been amended over a hundred times, with each amendment expanding the power and reach of the Federal Reserve System to create more money out of nothing. The Board of Governors are appointed a 14-year term by the President and approved by the Senate, but they are all selected from the upper echelons of the banking industry. Only the Fed's board is considered an independent agency of the federal government. It should be noted that none of their decisions have to be approved by the president, legislators, or any elected official. 
Thank. What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. The other components of the Fed, the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, and the Federal Open Market Committee have no governmental checks and balances whatsoever. Everything they do is secret. The Fed is not subject to third-party inspections. The Fed is not and has never been audited. The Fed is not accountable to anyone for its actions. Once appointed, the Board of Governors can act in any way they desire. So who has the power to influence or direct their behavior or the course of events of the Federal Reserve. The End Game In 2000, there were seven countries that did not have a Rothschilds owned or controlled central bank. Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. The way to force a country to accept a central bank is by survival necessity. The central banks need to create a situation that requires the country to need more money than it can provide to itself. This is generally accomplished through acts of terrorism or war. It has been a successful modus operandi for the central banks since the Napoleonic Wars when the Rothschild banks realized that they could finance and profit from the debt created from both sides of the warring factions. The central banks have been recreating scenarios like this all around the world ever since. The reality is that wars obliterate a country requiring financial help to rebuild once it's over and this is where the central banks step in like the heroes of the day and offer to finance the nation's rebuild. For a modest usury fee of course. It really leaves that nation with no choice. If any other nation offers to assist, they are quickly snapped back in line by the central banks. Just three years later, in 2003, only five countries remained without a Rothschild controlled or owned central bank. Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. From 2011 to the present, only three countries remain. Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. The Western world has been placing sanctions and making claims against these countries in every attempt to bait them into any possible hostile action to justify their annihilation. Think about all the wars and conflicts that we have seen since the year 2000 and what countries have been on the receiving end and then ask yourself, why? These are the only countries left in the world who own their own money, control their own economy, in spite of the fact that the US, UN, and world have basically isolated these countries from any trade or international commerce for the past 50 years. Imagine if for the past 50 years no foreign goods or services were allowed to be imported into your country and nothing you produce was allowed to be bought by other countries. This is what all these countries that have resisted the Rothschild central banks have had to endure right up to the point that they were invaded and forced to accept them. And there are three left. Want to bet which countries the next conflicts are created in? Did you find this content informative? Who do you think owns and controls the Federal Reserve banking system? Let me know in the comment section below. A big thank you to all who support this channel and especially to those who take the time to like, comment, share, and subscribe. It is greatly appreciated. If you enjoy learning about precious metals and finance, stop by the ST66 Discord channel. The link is below. It's totally free and you can monitor other conversations or chime in yourself and be a part of them. 
It's a great place to get questions answered and stay up to date with the latest precious metals news and events. If you're not yet a subscriber, hit the subscribe button. Then be sure to select the notification bell so that you'll be notified as soon as I post up new content. And as always, feel free to share this content with all. Thank you.